please. Everyone help us sing. church and for the people in our church who uh, have uh, are serving you uh, through our local church. We pray, Lord, that we would continue to do that, that we would uh, live our lives, Lord, in a way that uh, bring honor and glory to your name, in a way that uh, would point people to you, Lord. Help us to be uh, that kind of people where uh, we're serving you and we're pointing people uh, to you. We do love you, Lord, and we thank you for and blessings that you give us in our lives, and we thank you for uh, just the, uh, the fact that the Lord Jesus died on the cross for our sins so that we could have salvation, Lord. And I pray that uh, if there's someone here today who doesn't know you as Savior, Lord, that we would uh, they just to see their need for you today and, and allow uh, the Holy Spirit to just speak to their heart, Lord. But we do uh, thank you for this evening. We pray again tonight that we would just focus our hearts and our minds on you. We'd let you speak to us. We pray that uh, you would just bless the preaching tonight, Lord, that it would stir our hearts so we could I continue to serve you. We do love you and we thank you for all you do. It's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Number five.
Amen. Well, you can be seated this evening, and we do want to welcome you again to Tri-State Baptist Temple, and we're excited to finish our day in the Lord's house, and uh, it's been ex- a good day to be here for the first uh, Sunday of the new year, and been uh, just a good day. And uh, we do want to make a few announcements, just remind you about a few things again quickly this evening about uh, just some of the things going on in the life of our church. Don't forget that January the 18th is going to be our vision day this year. And uh, I really enjoyed when Pastor did that last year. And so I'm looking forward to that again this year. And he's going to kind of look over some things that we've done. Uh, throughout the last year and then look ahead for this new year and I'm I'm excited about that so I hope you'll mark that on your calendar and make sure that you're here uh, all day on that Sunday January the 18th and uh, just be praying for that service and we want to uh, pray that, uh, for our pastor as he prepares to preach and uh, on that day but we want to be pre- our own hearts to be prepared as uh, he gives us presents to us what the Lord has laid on his heart we want to uh, now support our pastor and follow the lead uh, that the Lord has given us uh, throughout the next year. So I'm excited about that and I hope you will be too. Uh, We'll give out our church calendars uh, that day as well and so we'll be looking forward to that and uh, so just be in prayer for that uh, important day. Uh, Don't forget to just continue to be praying for our finances and our missions offering and again we just want to praise the Lord. We've had uh, some good months uh, dealing with our general fund. In fact the whole uh, 2014 was a great year and so we uh, praise the Lord for that. Our missions offering last month was uh, was good. It was uh, exceeded what we needed and so that will definitely be a blessing and help us and we want to just continue to pray that uh, the Lord will use us in these areas. So we'll be good stewards of all uh, the resources and things that God uh, gives us so that we can uh, then just invest in eternity through our local church. And I think that's important. I think that's uh, what the Bible teaches us. And so we praise the Lord. We've been doing well and we want to continue to do well in those things. So I hope you'll keep praying about those things and uh, just keep allowing the Lord to use us in these things. Uh, continue to pray for our Kings Court basketball and cheer program. Uh, uh, we were excited to have our first practice uh, uh, yesterday, and uh, I believe we had a good turnout. And we have several more that couldn't make it last this past Saturday that are planning on coming, and so we're excited about that. Excuse me. We'll still register uh, people if they haven't registered yet and they've decided they want to participate and be a part of that. There's still uh, time for that. We can do that this week. So please uh, let me know or, or you can let Drew know as well. If you have any questions about that or want to get somebody registered, please uh, do that this week. And we will look forward to that. Uh, so uh, then don't forget as well, today is Pastor Tim's birthday. Uh, It's today, and so we're going to have a fellowship after church tonight. I want to invite everybody to come after the service tonight uh, over to the ministry center and uh, have uh, some finger food, some desserts, and different things over there and celebrate with Pastor uh, this evening after church, uh, his birthday. So we're excited about that as well. But we will ask our men to come forward this time. We'll take up our tithes offering, our missions offering this evening. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together this evening. Amen.
right, we're going to take up our children's change offering tonight for summer camp, and now uh, we're uh, over the hump into the new year and looking downhill toward camp, and that'll be here in the month of June. We have our date uh, reserved for that, and we're looking forward to it and planning about it, and that's some things we'll talk a little bit more about on Vision Night as well. We'll uh, reveal our camp theme for the year and let all the boys and girls know a little bit more about what we're uh, going to be getting into that week of camp, and so uh, that's always exciting. And what you give in this offering makes camp possible. So uh, your investment in this uh, is going to uh, going to be uh, noted, and uh, it's going to give back some eternal dividends. And so we are thankful for that opportunity uh, to give to church camp. So uh, you get your offering out and have it ready, and we're going to get our volunteers to come up and help us out. If you are in elementary school or younger, I need your help. Come on and help me out. Come on. I need your help. Gregory, can you help me too? Be good. Good job. I like having more. Now, Daniel, you got another boy, don't you? We're two on two here. All right, we're going to, uh, just a minute, pray together and thank the Lord for the offering. Then everybody's going to raise their hand that has offering, and all you have to do is just go up there and hold your cup out, and they put money in it. And uh, if you don't think they give enough, then don't move. Just stay there with your cup out, all right? And then you bring it back up here and put it in the jug, all right? And we're going to keep that away, and that's going to help feed you because you guys eat a lot at camp, don't you? Yeah. All right, well, let's pray together. Father, we are thankful people that we have uh, this new year that lies ahead of us, and God, we know and we have your promise of your presence in our life for the child of God, and Lord, we have the great promise that you have a purpose for us and Lord, uh, Father, for the greatest time in our lives, uh, Lord, we pray this year we'll know that purpose and live and see it fulfilled. And Lord, we just ask you to bless the offering tonight. Thank you for church camp. And Lord, we thank you for these boys and girls. I pray for each of them that, Lord, they'll know you as their Savior. Then know what a joy it is to live for you and to serve you. And uh, we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you have some offering, just hold your hand up. and. They're going to come around and pick that up. Great job. Thank you for the help. I appreciate that so much, and that really helps us take care of that important business on a Sunday night, and uh, that's a real blessing. I want to just remind all the families, be sure you make another trip back to the Christmas card room because there are still a lot of Christmas cards back there that people haven't picked up, and uh, we're going to go through there this week and separate those out and try to take those that might have been brought in for our shut-ins and be sure we get those to them but there could still be some cards back there for you and uh, there could be a gift card to the Cracker Barrel back there and you don't even know about it so be sure you go and get them and check yeah there goes somebody <laughs> back there to look right now so uh, uh, don't forget about that just go back right after the service and make one more trip through there and be sure there's not anything for you and then we have these uh, three poinsettias that are here and they still look really, really nice. They, somebody can get some good enjoyment out of them. So if these uh, are yours and you'd like to, uh, to have them and take them home with you, then please do that. And uh, you, can, uh, you can give them away or just enjoy them yourself. But we sure appreciate you bringing them in. Uh, we tried to have, we felt like, the latest list of names in the bulletin this morning. 
of who these things were brought in for. Uh, if you filled out a card and, and we got the card, we had that record. But uh, if you didn't, uh, I apologize that we didn't have that information. But uh, uh, we're thankful and, and blessed uh, to have them. And then uh, I spoke to Miss Kathy uh, today, and uh, she, uh, she says and feels like it's going to work out best for, for her family on Friday if maybe they just have uh, a couple meat trays or uh, some chips and bread and drinks, those kind of things, rather than have a big full carry-in meal. Most of their family are out of town. They're going to come in and take right off and go back to wherever they've got to go. So uh, what we felt might be best is if you'd like to make a donation toward purchasing those, uh, you can just let mom have that and, and uh, we'll be sure we purchase those things and get them to them, probably take them before the service and that way if they have family who've come into the home before then because it's not going to be till 2.30 and so that would be good to have it there around lunchtime for her at her home and then you know, a lot of the family again are just going to drop in and go and she said that will work out best for her. So if you'd like to have a part in that or give something toward that, then you can just be sure you let uh, her have that and let mom have that and, and we'll take care of that. So, But keep praying for her and uh, she said she had a good day and uh, rested well last night and so she's thankful for her prayers and, and uh, looking forward to getting back in here when she can and so uh, just keep praying for her and remembering her. Well, you noticed in the bulletin, I'd ask Evan to be prepared to preach tonight, and so in just a minute, he's going to come and bring the message for us. Well, I believe we have a group that's going to sing a special for us this evening, so uh, why don't you all come right ahead, and then as soon as they're finished, Evan's going to bring the message here tonight. Amen. What a blessing to have uh, that 
size of a group of our uh, youth group to be able to come and participate and uh, sing in that song, and we're uh, just thankful for that and excited to be able to see that in our church. And I'm going to apologize for whatever reason I've gotten emotional already. I don't know why, but, well, I do, but <laughs> I'm thankful that the pastor has let me preach today. I don't know why. I'm sorry. <laughs> As uh, like many people do, when we think about a new year, we begin to think about and reflect on just the past year and look towards the new year. And I do that like everybody else. And when I get asked to preach, I don't normally think about the situation because, uh, you know, I, as not being a pastor, being the assistant, I don't preach every week. I don't uh, preach a Christmas message or an Easter message or a New Year's message. I don't normally do that. But this year, as he, I get to preach the first Sunday in the evening, I thought about past year. And, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, the Lord led me to uh, look at a passage in 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, looking at the Apostle Paul writing, and uh, it's the last letter that he, uh, we have recorded of him writing, 2 Timothy. And, uh, of course, the Apostle Paul, a great missionary, a great preacher that we have recorded in the Bible, the uh, Lord used him in such a mighty way. And, After he accepted Christ and began to live for him and to serve him, he did so much for the Lord. And uh, the Lord used him to write, ne pen nearly half of the New Testament. And, the, uh, and this being the final uh, letter that he wrote, it's very personal. Uh, he wrote it to the preacher, Timothy, uh, a young preacher who he had uh, seen uh, come to know Christ in his own ministry and seen him begin to live for the Lord and to do his work. And Paul, now at this point in his life, he's in prison. He's in Rome. He's been in jail a couple times, and now that's where he's at. <clears throat> and yet, as he's thinking back on his life now, and he's looking to Timothy, and he's writing this kind of final letter to Timothy, and he's giving him some instruction and some encouragement in life. Uh, I mean, I just think about where he's at at this point. He's, setting, he's in a prison. In, the, in one of the verses we'll read in just a moment, he speaks of needing his cloak or his coat. You can imagine him being cold and being uncomfortable. And uh, Throughout his life, he dealt with a lot of um, hardships. And, and uh, they tried to kill him a couple times. He was shipwrecked. and uh, He didn't have an easy life. And that was true because he chose to serve the Lord. And there he's sitting in prison and yet... He's writing to Timothy, and he's reflecting back on his life and as he's lived, and uh, he wants to give Timothy this final piece of instruction. Timothy, again, was a man that he had won to the Lord, and he cared much about. They were living in a time of persecution. Uh, the emperor Nero uh, was uh, in control at that time, and he uh, did like Christians. He persecuted them. Uh, I can imagine Paul sitting before him and uh, his time being imprisoned and uh, being in bondage and how that must have been a scary and a terrible thing. Nero was uh, a dictator kind of leader. He just did what he wanted. He was in control. If you think about present day dictators or the dictators that we've uh, thought about in recent history, they're, you know, we just think of them as evil and uh, you know, scary. Kind of, that would be Nero. That's the kind of leader he would have been. And... Uh, but Paul loved Timothy, and he wanted Timothy to do things the right way. Timothy to do things the way that the Lord uh, wanted him to do. <clears throat> Why I got emotional is because I thought a lot about doing things the right way. And, you know, people don't do things the right way anymore. I'm going to get under control, I think. I'm going to get it. I've been prepared at times incorrectly for the ministry. I got in, I just didn't know any better, sat under some teaching that was not correct. I'm thankful that the Lord has helped me not follow mainstream kind of teachings 
and just follow the Bible. Just do what's right. Paul reflected back, and, and I'll speak a little bit about how he had godly people in his life that the Lord brought into his life through his ministry. And I'm thankful for what the Lord has done in my life. And so I'm excited to be able to sit in a Bible preaching church, and it's their fault they did it when they sang, because I thought about the ministry that we have at our church. We don't do things like other churches. We do things like a lot of good churches, but we are getting outnumbered more and more, but we're doing things according to the Bible, according to God's Word. And it's, it's good to see a group that's going to serve the Lord and do it the right way. And it encourages me to keep on doing things the right way. <clears throat> I'm sorry, you don't want to watch me cry. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get past it. <laughs> this epistle, along with 1 Timothy and Titus, they're known as the pastoral epistles. Uh, they're written, they're called that because there's a lot of information that help uh, and speak to the office of the pastor. And uh, so that's why, they, why they're called that. And of course, Paul, a veteran now, missionary and preacher, is writing to a pastor to help him with instruction and uh, it is true that that's, these help in the office of a pastor, but it's also very true that they're very relevant and important uh, to all Christians, to all believers. And uh, these letters help us to be better servants of the Lord. And as we look at our passage today, we're going to understand that as Paul writes directly to Timothy, God is using these truths to encourage us and to edify all believers. And so uh, that's what we want to look at today in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I'm going to begin reading verse number 1 and just see if I can read the verses for a minute and get calmed down. But in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 1, the Bible says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, rebuke exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. <clears throat> For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of the evangelist, make full proof of the ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed into Thessalonica. Uh, Christine's to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for this ministry. Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus, the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer no man stood with me, but all, for, all men forsook me. I pray, God, that it, may be, that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me, strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, preserve me into his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together as we look at this passage this evening. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the privilege it is to be able to know you as our Savior, Lord. We're so thankful that you loved us so much that you let Jesus come uh, to earth and to live uh, through the same troubles and trials that we go through, to be tempted like as we are, Lord, but yet He did it without sin. He, he lived perfectly so that He could go to the cross and die in my place, Lord. 
for my sin, and for the sins of each individual sitting here today, and for the sins of the world. Lord, we're thankful for that, and we're thankful that not only did he die, but after they buried him, he rose again, defeating death and sin and hell and the grave so that we could have salvation. Lord, we're so thankful for that. We're thankful for the Word of God, and for what it means to us, Lord, and for the direction, the encouragement, the correction for the blessings that come uh, to our lives through your word. Lord, we're so thankful for that. And Lord, today as we look in your word again, we pray that you would give us uh, discernment in our own lives. Give us uh, correction where we need it in our own lives. And help us, Lord, to realize that our lives as Christians are about you and living for you and serving you. We're thankful for the Apostle Paul and how you used him, Lord, and we pray that as we read uh, these words that you inspired, that uh, they would uh, speak to our hearts and souls tonight, Lord. But we do love you and thank you for all you do. I pray you'd help me as we preach tonight, that you would just uh, help me to uh, speak clearly and and present your word uh, faithfully tonight. But We love you and we thank you. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. And tonight, as we look in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I just want to think about uh, some of these things that the Apostle Paul uh, wrote to uh, this preacher, Timothy. And as we begin to look through this passage, the first thing that I want you to notice is that Paul challenges Timothy to serve well. Paul challenges Timothy to serve well. I titled uh, the message, Paul's Final Charge, Preach the Word. Uh, preach the word. And, uh, t- and Paul uh, challenging Timothy in this final passage to serve the Lord well. First, I want you to notice in verse number one of the importance of the charge. In verse number one, the Bible says again, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing at his kingdom. This charge is important, number one, because it was made before God. The Bible says, who shall judge? And if you're a Christian today, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior today, you realize that uh, your heavenly Father is Almighty God. And that uh, one day we'll stand before Him in judgment. And as Paul is thinking about his life and he's thinking about giving Timothy some instruction, he reminds him that I'm giving you this charge or this challenge, not just... of of my own will or something that I've thought about or under my authority, but this is under the authority of Almighty God. And He's given us some instructions, and He's given us a challenge uh, for our lives, and I want to remind you of that today. And so it's important for us to remember that this is before God. And as we live our lives, we live it before God. And the things that we do, the way that we serve God, it's before Him. It's not for, I don't serve God for myself or I don't serve God for my church, or I don't serve God for my pastor, but I serve God for Him, and because He loves me, and because uh, I love Him, and that's why we serve Him. I am aware that one day I will stand before Him in judgment, and not to decide whether I get to go to heaven or not. No, the Lord Jesus took care of that on the cross, and when I accepted Him as my Savior, but I will stand before Him to give an account for the way that I've lived my life after I accepted Him. And we want to be aware of that. And that reminds us of the importance of what Paul is getting ready to say to Timothy. And so we see that the charge is important, but then secondly, we just want to see what that charge or that challenge is. And simply it is preach the Word. Preach the Word. Again, we said that Uh, You know, these are a part of the pastoral epistles uh, they've been called. And while it is true that uh, called men of God are those who do the preaching uh, in the sense that I'm doing it right now, I'm standing behind the pulpit in the church preaching, it's also true that all believers have been given a charge by God to proclaim the gospel to proclaim the word to the world. And that phrase, preach the word, that's the idea, to proclaim or to herald the message that God has given us. And so the the Bible was very clear in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, Mark 16, 15, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30, all these, uh, those places and many others, the Bible was clear that as Christians, we have been given the responsibility by God to tell others about Him. We call it soul winning. Because we want to lead people 
to the Lord. We want to win their soul to the Lord. We want them to accept Jesus Christ as Savior. And so all people have been given, all believers have been given this challenge or this uh, charge, preach the word. And so think about it then for a second in verse 2. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. So first we see we're to proclaim the message or preach the word. And again, we said that means to herald or to proclaim the message. Uh, listen, if you've been saved today, if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you can tell somebody else how to be saved. Uh, you just simply tell them what happened to you. But of course, as Christians, as a new Christian, we can very simply do that. And then as we grow, we become more comfortable with God's Word and we can help better people better understand. And we ought to always be growing in the faith so that we can better proclaim the message that God has given us and that we've accepted and that we believe. So we're to proclaim the message. Also, we're to always be ready. It says there to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Again, if you think about a, a preacher or a pastor, uh, they are ready when a pastor knows that he's going to preach Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And so during the week, he is constantly preparing for the messages that he's going to preach. And uh, in my case, as a, as a preacher and uh, as the assistant here, as I don't preach every service, when a pastor gives me an assignment to preach on this date, I can then sit down and prepare for that message. And so I'm ready. That's in season. I know it's coming, I know it's going to be here, and I'm ready for it. So I'm ready for that, I'm ready to preach, I'm prepared for today. But I also must be ready out of season. I must be ready when it's not convenient for me, or I wasn't expecting it. Uh, I need to be ready, not just simply to stand behind the pulpit, but to proclaim the message. And there might be a time when I'm just out about in my day, and God gives me opportunity to share the gospel with an individual. Or somebody, uh, maybe this has happened to you, somebody's come to you and they've asked you a question about the Bible or about uh, something in Christianity. And maybe you weren't expecting it at that moment. Maybe you are mentally weren't ready for that. Maybe you're having a bad day or maybe you're not feeling so well. Uh, you know what? But at those times when God gives us the opportunity, we must be ready to proclaim the message. And it's not... It's easy when you know it's coming. As a preacher, when pastors uh, said, I want you to preach this Sunday night, that was easy for me to know. I'm going to preach at 6 o'clock on Sunday night. That was easy. But there's going to be other times when it's not going to be so easy. When you've had a long day, you're sleep, you just want to go home and rest. But God gives opportunity. So we must be ready to proclaim the message. So we're to proclaim the rest message. We're to always be ready. In fact, 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and, and fear. We're to always be ready to present the gospel or to share with people the love of Christ and the message that God has given us. So always be ready. Thirdly, in that verse, we see those words reprove and rebuke. And you know, we don't always like that part of the message, do we? As Christians, it's, that's not our favorite part of the preaching usually when the pastor is preaching or the preacher is preaching and it hurts a little bit. Conviction comes into our life when we're being reproved or rebuked. That's not always our favorite part. And you know what? As Christians, that's not always our favorite thing to present as well. You see, as Christians, we, we don't want to sugarcoat life. Uh, I was telling my Sunday school class this morning that it's important for people to understand that there's a problem in order to find the solution. If you don't know there's a problem, you won't seek a solution. If you have a home and you have bad wiring in the, inside the wall, if nobody tells you or there's no evidence of that bad wiring, you won't seek to fix it. All right, And it will be there until it causes you a problem. And it'll sneak up. If you don't know there's bad wiring, it might create a problem, it might mess something up or, or cause damage and could have been prevented had you known it was there. But if you are going to buy a home or you have some man come and inspect your house and uh, inspect it before you're going to purchase it or those kind of things, and they come and say you have a good home but this section of wiring right here is bad, you better replace it, then you know there's a problem so you can go in and fix that problem so that it doesn't cause you problems in the future. Listen, I said as a church... Uh, we're, not, we're not going to sugarcoat anything. We're going to, we're going to preach the Bible. We're going to tell you that sin is sin. 
We're going to say, thus saith the Lord. Because somebody who's not saved, when they come into the church house, they need to understand that they're lost. Listen, I don't, I don't want to make people feel bad. I don't want to make people upset. That's not the goal. But I have to preach the message so they can understand that they're lost in order to find the solution. Jesus is the solution for everybody. Everybody needs the Lord. But they're not going to understand that until they realize they have a problem. But the problem of sin, it affects all men. And so to reprove and to rebuke, those are things we don't necessarily like to be a part of, but they're so important in the message of God. And so we must be bold. We must be bold. There are times when you might be witnessing to somebody and they say, well, I like to participate in this or I like to be a part of that. And some people will tell them that's okay. As long as you love the Lord, you can still do whatever you want to do. Listen, I can't do that. Because the Bible says certain things are wrong. Certain things displease him. So I must, if somebody asks me my opinion about something and I can open up the Bible and say that is wrong, i got to do it. I've got to be bold. Uh, my goal is not to run them off. My goal is not to make them never come back. But I have to do it because they have to understand their need for Jesus before they'll accept him. So we must be bold in the proclamation of the Bible. Listen, it's not my job to tell somebody, to, to, force, to make somebody mad. It's not my job to, make, to convict somebody. Uh, it's not my job to make somebody uncomfortable. My job is to proclaim the message. It's the job of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God uh, to bring conviction and, and, to, and, and to reprove and rebuke. You know, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, back just a little bit, we know that a familiar passage of scripture in verse 15 that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus all scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction and in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect thoroughly furnished unto all good works the word of God is what is going to do a work in our life listen as Christians we need to proclaim the message but we also need to step back and let the Word of God do its work in our lives. Because we know uh, the, the Jesus' teaching, I can't help somebody get a speck out of their eye if I've got a beam in my own. And we've got to let the Word of God do its work in our lives so that we can boldly be ready always to proclaim the message. And so we've got to remember that. But then also it says at the end of that to exhort with all long, long, long suffering and doctrine in, in verse 2. Not only are we to proclaim the message, to always be ready and to be bold in our, in our proclamation of the gospel, but we also have to do it with long suffering. In other words, we have to proclaim the truth with the right spirit, the right attitude, and have patience in what we're doing. I'm so thankful that the Lord was long-suffering with me. And I'm so thankful that He's still long-suffering with me. He showed long-suffering towards me in that He gave me time in my life to accept Him as Savior. And I'm so thankful that He continues to be long-suffering in my life as, as I mess up and as I fail Him. He, he helps me to see my mistakes and, and see where I failed Him and helps correct me and, and move me back to where I need to be. I'm thankful for his long suffering. And now as a child of God and as a servant of him, he wants me to be long suffering as well. And he wants me to have the right spirit and attitude as well. Here's what we sometimes do. We see somebody who we know that they're living in open sin and rebellion against God and our attitude is they are evil and they're awful. And I'm going to tell them what the Bible says so they can get right. But we have the wrong attitude. We have the wrong motive. Our motive's got to be love. We love the Lord because He first loves us. And if I'm going to reach somebody with the gospel of Jesus Christ, I've got to show them the love of Christ, what we've talked about all year, the love of Christ. Now, that, my love for them doesn't make the message any easier. I still have got to be bold and preach the gospel, but I've got to have the right spirit. That takes a lot of help from the Lord. A lot of time in prayer. So uh, Paul challenges Timothy to serve him well. He says to preach the word, proclaim the message. Always be ready, reprove, rebuke, to be bold in the, in, in your, in, 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 with the gospel and also to exhort with long suffering and with doctrine, by the way. It says with doctrine. We have to use the word of God. We need to use the 
principles we learn from the Word of God, and we need to learn uh, our methods from God's Word. We need to follow this book and not anything else as we are presenting the gospel. And so Paul challenges Timothy to serve well. We saw the charge was important, and we saw the challenge to preach the Word, but we also see in these first few verses uh, a warning. A warning. In verses 3 through 5, again, the Bible says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teach, teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things, endure inflictions, do the work of evangelists, make full proof of the ministry. Listen, Paul was warning Timothy that he will face a great struggle as he tries to spread the gospel and live for the Lord. He says, Timothy, I want you to know it's not always going to be easy. Not always going to be easy. And again, it's why I struggled when we started here a little bit ago because there are times when you think, well, those other people, they're making everybody feel good and it looks a whole lot easier. They're attracting big crowds and uh, people feel good and everybody's just all, all happy and excited, but we understand they're not really preaching the Bible, but yet they're happy. And we think, well, maybe I can pull a little bit of that in. No. Paul said, it's going to be hard, Timothy. And listen, the same things that Timothy went through in his life, we're going through today. People have itching ears. They want, to, they want to go to the place where they're going to tell them what they want to hear. Have you ever met somebody that asked you for advice, and you told them they, the advice, and they said, well, I don't care, I'm going to do what I want to do anyway. You know, that happens, right? That's what people do in, uh, that's what Christians do in church. They'll go to the church, they'll hear the preacher preach, they don't like it, so they'll just go somewhere else. You know what? That's hard. If you're involved in the local church and you, and you love your church and you want to do what you, that's hard when that happens in our place, right? And that can be discouraging. But Paul wanted Timothy to remember, listen, I'm telling you it's going to happen. Don't give up ground. Don't compromise. Don't change. We're going to face those things. There are going to be many enemies to the gospel. Those false teachers. Those people desiring to please the flesh more than they please God. They're going to be everywhere. They're going to be all around us. But Paul encourages Timothy that in spite of this, he, need, he wanted him to be in guard, be on guard himself from the enemies of the gospel and strive to live for God and to see Christ do a great work through his obedience to the word and to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we think about the charge, we too have to realize, listen, it's not going to always be easy, but God has a perfect plan. And there's going to be discouragements around us, and sometimes we might think, am I doing what's right? Listen, we know that if we're following God's word, and we're doing what this book says, then we can rejoice in knowing that God is in control, and that he will bring the victory. He'll bring the victory. In, uh, in, my, in Super Church this morning, as we taught, uh, we were looking at Joshua as he led the nation of Israel, and they went to Jericho, and God gave them some strange instructions. He said, in order to beat this city, you're just going to have to march around the walls. One day, go march around. Next day, I want you to march around again. Then the last day, he said, I want you to march around seven times. Those people made fun of them. They, uh, you can imagine if uh, that was us and we uh, in the world today and uh, uh, some enemy came, they just were going to just march around our country. and just They were just going to circle us. What good is that going to do, we would think? But what happened? On that seventh day, they marched around seven times. They called out to God and they blew those horns and all those walls fell down. Because they obeyed, they won the victory. But we also saw that after that, Achan disobeyed God. Because God said, don't take anything, destroy it all. But Achan went in, he stole a few things, kept them to himself, hid them under his tent. And nobody knew that Achan had done that. He got away with it. Not another person knew that Achan stole those things and disobeyed God, except for the Lord. He knew. Nobody else knew. Joshua saw Ai over in the distance, and he knew that was the next place that God had for them to take. And he said, we don't need all these people. We just took great, this great city of Jericho. This will be easy. Sent some men down, and they just got whooped. Uh, Ai just took them. And they had to retreat. And Joshua said, God, what is going on? How come we weren't able to win this battle? God said, somebody in the camp has disobeyed. Joshua had to seek the face of God, and the people came together. Achan uh, finally admitted that he was the one at fault. You know what happened to Achan? Achan lost his life. 
because of his disobedience. But you know what? When that was cleared away, everybody in the camp was right with God again, they were able to go back down to Ai and win easily. God gave the victory. Listen, in our lives as we live, there's going to be times when we're discouraged and we think this is not right. There's going to be times when our wallets are light and yet we haven't given our, our, our offering yet or our missions offering yet. We're going to think, is this really what I need to do? All my friends can afford a new car payment, but I can't because I give my missions offering. Listen, the directions from God sometimes don't make sense to us, but he always gives the victory. He always gives the victory. Paul wanted Timothy to remember, stand ground. Serve the Lord well. There's not a greater life you can have than when you're serving Him well. And so he, Paul challenges Timothy. Paul challenges Timothy to serve the Lord well. Secondly, and I'll try to move fast here, Paul reminds Timothy of his love for Christ's return. Okay, he's challenged Paul. Excuse me, Paul's challenged Timothy, and now as he's reflecting on his life, he, remind, he wants to remind Timothy, the thing that's gotten me through my life, the thing that's kept me close to the Lord is my love for him, my love for his coming. In verse 6, we see that Paul was ready to die. He had lived his life. He knew that the end of his life was coming soon. He said, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. As Paul reflected on his life, he was able to say with confidence that he was ready to meet the Lord and stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ. He was ready for that. Because in verse number 7 he says, For I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Paul, as he's ending his life and he reflects back on his life, he said, I fought a good fight. He remembered and realized what it was that he lived his life. Remember before he was a Christian, he was a zealous religious person but he was not following Christ. And he was a persecutor of Christians. He thought he was doing a good thing. He lived his life. He was well respected. He had uh, means. He was, uh, he was in, if we would put him in our society today, he would have been you know, some great leader in our society today that people looked up to, but he wasn't a Christian. But then he met Jesus on the road to Damascus and everything changed in his life. And from that point on, his whole life was dedicated to serving the Lord and doing whatever he could to follow Christ. And nothing else mattered but just following Christ. Following Christ. And he remembered that that fight that he was engaged in, that fight against sin and that uh, battle against the flesh and, and, and just seeking to serve the Lord and win battles for the Lord, he realized that was a good fight. What he gave up, that stuff was nothing. In fact, he called it dung. He called it what needed to be in the garbage. Uh, it was worthless. But what he had in Christ, it was the good fight. It was worth it. He said, I finished his course. Uh, he, he had done the things that God had asked him to do. You think about maybe a, a runner. Uh, they have a, a course or a path that they need to go. And they run that whole race. And when they get to the finish line, they have finished the course. They have run the complete race. They didn't give up. They didn't fall out before they got to the finish line. They made it all the way there. Paul was able to say, because of his life of service to the Lord and living for him, he was say, I finished my course. I've done the things that God has called me to do. And then he said, I've kept the faith. He said, throughout my life, from the time I've accepted him, he's not saying he was perfect and he never messed up, but he was saying that uh, I have kept the faith. I have relied on the Lord. I've stayed close to him, and I've served him with my life. Paul, as he reflected on his life, was able to say with confidence he was ready to meet the Lord because he fought a good fight, he kept the course, and he finished his course, and he kept the faith. And then Paul also wanted to remind Timothy that he was going to receive a crown of righteousness. Look at there again in verse number 8. He says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, not to me only, but unto all them, also that love his appearing. The Apostle Paul was going to receive a reward, this crown of righteousness. He was going to receive that because he was a man who loved the appearing of Christ or the coming of Christ. He loved the fact that Jesus was coming again. He lived his life in anticipation of the fact that the Lord was coming again. All that he did, he knew that Jesus was coming again, and so he was working towards that time when he was going to meet his Savior. And so all the secondary things in life didn't matter so much. All that mattered was that Christ is coming again. And I'm going to work 
towards the fact that he's coming and he loved his appearing. But what does that mean? It says, because it says there, Paul reminds us that all who serve the Lord as someone who loves the coming of Christ will be able to receive this reward or this crown of righteousness. Well, how then do we live in a way that we love the appearing of Christ? Well, we live a righteous or obedient life serving the Lord. He said, uh, again, uh, the righteous judge shall give me at that day, not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Uh, because he fought a good fight, because he had kept the faith and finished his course, because he was living obediently and serving the Lord according to God's will, he was able to live in anticipation of the coming of the Lord. But let's think about this. If you're not right with the Lord, if you're living in sin, if you're not doing things that you're supposed to be doing in your life, you know, maybe you, you don't study the Bible like you ought to, or maybe you're not in prayer like you ought to be. Maybe you're not faithful to the house of God like you ought to be. Uh, maybe uh, there's other things in your life you know that displease the Lord. When you live in that state in your life, you're not excited about Christ's coming. Because you know you've got to stand before him at judgment. Remember he spoke of judgment right at the beginning. But because Paul was living righteously or living in obedience to the Lord, he was excited that the Lord was coming again. And that's what God wants for all of us. He wants us to be able to live in that state of excitement and joy and, and peace and contentment and, and all those things to be, uh, to be evident and manifest in our life. And that is only possible when we're living in obedience to him. And so when we forsake God's work in order to pursue other things in life, whether it's money or our career or whether it's just our hobbies or the things that we like, sports, hey, doesn't that take away most of, a lot of our families from the house of God and the work of God? Uh, sports, uh, hobbies, all those things. When we pursue those things, we leave out the work of God. And when we do that, we are not in obedience to Him, and then we can't love His appearing because we're not looking forward to this. We're going to be, we're going to be instead of being able to stand before Him unashamed, we're going to be afraid of being ashamed as we stand before Him. And we'll not think about God anymore. And we'll try to put those things out of our mind because we know judgment is coming. A Christian knows that judgment is coming. But for the Christian the servant of God who's wholeheartedly serving Him with all of his heart. He's excited about the second coming of the Lord because he knows all that he's done, that good fight, finishing the course, keeping the faith, is leading to eternal life in heaven with our Savior. And what, what a joyful, wonderful truth of God that keeps us moving, keeps us motivated, and helps us to realize this, is just a, this life is a vapor. One day it's going to be gone, just in an instant, and then I'll stand before him. And all that I've done here, the only thing that's going to matter is what I've done for eternity. It doesn't matter how big my house is, or how nice my car is, or any of those things. What matters is how I've served the Lord. How I've served the Lord. Timothy, Paul wanted Timothy to know, I'm going to receive a reward because I was obedient to God. And you can have that reward too. And today we can have those rewards as we serve God according to His will. So Paul reminded Timothy of his love for Christ's return. And then the last thing I want you to notice and the thing that excites me the most as I read this passage is that Paul assures Timothy of the presence of the Lord in his life. The presence of the Lord. Let me start, though, in verse number 9. Remember these. He said, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed in Thessalonica, uh, Crescens to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia, and only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with me, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Tychicus hath I sent to Ephesus. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee in the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou also aware, for he hath greatly withstood our words. In these few verses, we see that in Timothy's life, God brought people into, excuse me, in Paul's life, God brought many different people into his life. There were some, like Timothy, who God brought into his life were a great blessing to Paul. And Paul said, Timothy, do diligence to come to me shortly. He said, I want to see you one more time before I die. Because he loved Timothy, he cared about him, because they had 
a unified spirit because they both just wanted to serve God and please Him. He said, I wanted to see Him. There were other men in Paul's life that were a great blessing to him, and God used in his life to help him better serve the Lord. For instance, in verse 11, we saw Luke. Verse 12, that Tychicus. Verse 13, that Corpus. These men God used to, to be a help to, to Timothy in his life. And we praise the Lord in our lives for the people that God brings in our lives that help us live for Him and to serve Him and just uh, enjoy the Lord in our lives. We're thankful for those people. Paul had those people and he was excited about that. But Paul wanted to let Timothy know as well that there have been some people, there have been some relationships in my life that have become a discouragement to me. He mentioned Demas. Demas had been a companion to Paul, but because Demas got sidetracked and fell in love with the things of the world instead of the things of God. He got sidetracked and he forsook Paul. He quit helping Paul. He didn't care about him anymore. That was discouraging to Paul. Listen, there's going to be times in our lives when relationships bring us discouragement and disappointment. It happens. It's going to be there. Uh, Paul mentioned uh, Alexander the coppersmith did evil to him. There's going to be times when people are just mean and evil to us. That happens. Mark and Paul... They had a rocky relationship. Mark and Paul had a falling out at one point, and they cut ties with each other. They went their separate ways. Now, we do praise the Lord that here we see in verse number 11 that they had mended their relationship, and God had helped them resolve that issue, and now Paul said, Mark is profitable to me. He's a blessing to me. He's helpful to me. And so Paul said, listen, there's going to be some good relationships in life. Praise the Lord for those. Uh, uh, stay close to those godly counselors in your life and let them let God use them in your life he said listen there's going to be some disappointments and discouragements in life but here's the thing that I want you to remember when we get to verse number 16 he said at my first answer no man stood with me Paul's now thinking about his prison sentence again and thinking about standing before uh, we might think of the judge and getting uh, you know going through a trial that kind of thing and he said nobody stood with me all men forsook me. He didn't have anybody there to help him. He didn't have anybody there to stand with him, to give him counsel or to be a witness for his good character. Nobody there to stand for it. He said, I pray, God, that it may not lay, be laid to their charge, notwithstanding. Look at verse 17. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me into his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul knew that although human relationships could not always be trusted, he knew that the Lord never left him. He never forsook him. Never failed him. The Lord was always there. And in our lives, there's going to be times when we feel like people just let us down, but we can always rely on God. And no matter what is happening around us, no matter what struggle we're going through, God is always there. Paul is in prison because he preached the gospel, because he served God. He's there with nobody to stand beside him. He's cold. He, can, he doesn't even have his, jet, his coat there. He doesn't even have his books that he loves or the scriptures with him, those parchments that he loves. He hasn't, he's stuck there. But he says, it's okay because the Lord is with me. We struggle. We have struggles in life. And if you're not going through one now, one's probably on the horizon. And listen, it's not always easy, but the Lord is with us. He'll never fail us. And as we obey, we get the victory. And as we obey, we, we get to experience the blessings that God has for us. He never leaves us, never forsakes us. I uh, have a commentary in my office written by a man named John Phillips, and he has an outline in this portion of his commentary about this passage that deals with the presence of the Lord. And I just want to give you that outline uh, quickly. It's from verse 17 and 18 in our passage. He says, he calls the Lord's presence, the Lord's conscious presence. In other words, in verse 17, he says, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. Paul was, uh, Paul could see and feel, and he knew that God was with him. It wasn't just a, a, a head knowledge, oh yes, I know God's with me, but he knew it. He, he experienced it. He knew that God was with him in his life, and in, with him at that moment and all the time. The Lord's conscious presence. Also, the Lord's conquering presence. It says, uh, notwithstanding the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. 
Not only was the Lord with him, but the Lord gave Paul strength in that terribly hard time. In our lives, when we are going through something difficult, God will give us strength. You know, tonight, uh, I think about Miss Kathy, and she's having, going to have a hard time. But the, God will give her strength as she trusts in him. His presence will be in her life as a, as a child of God. And he'll, she'll, he'll give her strength. And whatever we're going through, he'll give us strength. Whatever problem we have, God will give us strength. The Lord's confirming presence. And there again in verse 17, that by me the preaching might be fully known. Listen, there's times when we feel like I'm doing all I can for the Lord, but nobody's getting anything out of it. Nobody understands. Nobody. Listen, the Bible says his word will not return unto him void. If we will do what God tells us to do, wherever he's lead, led us, he, he gives us all different plans, different purposes in life, but ultimately our purpose is to glorify him and to share the gospel with others. He says, if you'll do that, I will do a work. And so his presence is a confirming presence. He says that the preaching may be fully known, what Paul wanted, that people would understand and believe. And God will do that as we just commit to doing what he tells us to do. The Lord's controlling presence. Verse 17 there again at the end, he says, And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Listen, that time standing before, uh, maybe it was Nero himself in that, in, during his trials, they could have just sentenced him to death immediately. And Paul said, he delivered me from the mouth of the lion. God protected me in that day. God delivered me from his mouth. The Lord's controlling presence. The Lord is in control of our life. There's going to be, the Bible says there's a point unto man, a time wants to die. And we understand that. But until that time, God's in control. He's, he has that a part of his plan, just like he has everything else. And every situation, every battle that comes into my life, for instance, Paul being in prison, that battle... God knew about it. He was in control. Paul knew God was in control. And then also the Lord's continuing presence. In verse 18, uh, it says, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. He said, He saved me from the mouth of the lion that day. And until I leave earth, God is going to be in my life. His presence, his control will be in my life continually. From the, it's from the moment of our salvation for all eternity. We have him living inside of us well, from the moment of salvation. And then when we leave this earth, whether it's through death or through uh, the catching up of, the, uh, of Christians to the rapture, we'll have the presence of the Lord in our lives. And so Paul assures Timothy of the presence of the Lord. Listen, as I got all cry earlier and got all stuck trying to talk and those things, listen, I know that what I'm doing is right. And I don't have to worry about anything else because as long as I do what's right, God's presence is with me. He's with me. He's in control. He, his presence is conscious. I know he's there. He's conquering. He's confirming presence. His controlling presence. And his continuing presence is with me always. As Paul reflected on the life that he had lived, he was able to say with confidence, from the time that he was saved until now, I have lived a life pleasing to the Lord. Paul was able to say, I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. When my life is over, I want to be able to say with confidence those same things about my life. I don't want to, I want that to be from now for the, the rest of my life. If God gives me one year let more in my life, or if he gives me 80 more years in my life, whatever it is, I want every day to be characterized by somebody who has lived completely sold out to him. I struggle with that just like everybody else. That's not always easy. I fight the flesh. Again, hence the teary eyes there earlier. It's hard, but God is with us. We've got to surrender to her. We need to be soul winners. Our goal should not be our careers. Our goal should not be even our families. Listen, that's secondary to God. Because when I'm serving God right, I'm taking care of my family right. My, goal, my, my, my life is not about my hobbies or my goal is not about trying to bring myself joy. My goal is serving Him. And when I'm doing that, everything I thought I wanted falls out of my mind and everything that makes life wonderful comes into my life as I serve Him. The Christian life is about serving and living for God and Him alone. There's, no fear, there's nothing to fear, no reason to hold back because as Christians we live with the great truths of God's presence always present 
in our life. I don't have to worry about my health and my bills and all those things. If I trust God, He'll take care of me. If I trust, and that that requires me to live obediently to Him. To live obediently to Him. I hope that after we looked at God's word today, that we can examine our own hearts and we can let Him work on us and help us to continue to grow closer to Him and continue just to seek Him, seek His face in our life. And it's my prayer for my life that I'll grow closer to Him, that I'll be a better servant to Him, that I'll be a better preacher, that I'll be a better assistant in this church, and that I'll just be the man that God's called me to be. And I hope that'll be your prayer. And that as a church, the Tri-State Baptist Temple, we can just serve God with all of our heart and we can seek to win people to Him. Well, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do love you so much and we thank you for the privilege it is to know you as Savior, Lord. We are thankful for how good you are to us, Lord, and the blessings that you give us and just the love that you have for us, Lord. And today, as we think about your word and we pray, Lord, you can just continue to help us to grow and help us to continue to live our lives for you, Lord. Make us, help us to be better servants for you. Help us to be a church that is a light to our community and a church that just uh, points people to you. We do love you, Lord. We thank you for all you do for us. And it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. And amen. Stand with us if you would. We'll... We'll be in hymn 465, hymn 465. Sing it with us if you would. sing the next verse in a moment but I'm thankful for a great message very needful message a timely message at this time of the year and if we know the Lord is our Savior whether we've been saved a year or ten or more <clears throat> we need to hear preaching like that we need to desire in our heart to be what we know God saved us to be we want our lives to grow we want Christ's presence to be more uh, we want to be more aware of it. We want to be more sensitive to the presence of the Lord in our life. And we want that purpose of God for our life. And this year, at this time of year, it's a great year just to set our heart and mind toward that and be steadfast and moving forward. Uh, it may mean some changes in our life in every way, but uh, in, ultimately in the end, there's nothing worth being able to stand where Paul stood at the end of his life and say, uh, I'm ready. I, I'm ready to meet Christ. I'm ready to meet the Lord. Uh, I believe with all my heart I've done what God would have me to do with what he's given me to serve him with. And may that be our desire as believers. You may be here today and you have never in your life received Jesus Christ as your Savior. See, there's only two kind of people in the world. There's people who are born-again believers. By grace, uh, through faith, they have acknowledge that they're sinners we're all sinners the Bible says we're born in sin the wages of sin is death people die and spend an eternity separated from God because of sin and we all are born that way and we can't do anything about it we need a Savior we need to be saved from that and Jesus Christ is the Savior he died for you he paid your sin debt he rose again from the grave for you. He lives for you today. He's your only hope of salvation for your eternal soul. Where Paul was able to stand at the end of his life and say, I'm ready now. Uh, I'm going to stand in the presence of my Savior. And uh, I'm going to live eternally with him. Uh, Paul could say that because of his faith in Christ. If you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, uh, today that's the greatest thing that is the most necessary thing in your life. Know Him as your Savior. Uh, ask Him to forgive your sin. Come into your heart. Take control of your life and, uh, and allow Him to do and be for you what He wants to do and be. So today that's the greatest need. 
Maybe you're here today and you'd say, I need someone to take the Bible and show me how I can be saved. I need to know how I can be saved. Then this invitation time is for you. This is why we do what we do. Uh, we're giving you that opportunity. You say, maybe after the service, I'd like to meet with you and talk to you about that. We will. We'll meet with you. We'll talk to you. Uh, but uh, today, this is an important thing for all of us, whether you're here and you know the Lord or not. Uh, great message. And uh, we want to be obedient people to the Lord. Let's sing that last verse and uh, let's just uh, obey the Lord. so good to have had you with us throughout the day and uh, we're honored uh, that you're here and we're thankful and uh, you've already been to church for the whole year so uh, so just one service at a time just keep being faithful make that the priority and be here be faithful and allow the Lord to do his work in your life we're excited about uh, all the things that we've been talking about as we move into the month of January uh, and tonight we want to invite everyone to stay in fellowship. I'm, I'm glad I found out this morning we're having this. And so I'm going to go. I'm going to be there and see what's going on over there. I know Ava brought some cupcakes, so uh, she might need help eating those. And, uh, and so we better go help out. But uh, we're going to pray tonight, ask the blessing on the refreshments right here, and then we're inviting everyone to come right over. Don't forget the, cup, uh, the uh, Christmas cards. And don't forget if you'd like to give... Uh, a donation toward helping with some things for uh, Kathy on Friday. You can see uh, Mom here and uh, take care of that. Now that that would be a blessing to Kathy. Well, let's pray together. Father, we are thankful people as we've been able to come out to the house of God, be able to hear your word. Your word, Lord, is uh, the most valuable, most precious thing that we can have and hear in our heart and life in this world. And so, Lord, we just ask you and uh, in your grace and mercy to take it and God just use it Lord as it needs to be used in our lives and Lord as we respond to it by faith it will change us it will make the changes in us that need to be made and Lord it will help us make the decisions and choices that need to be made in life that are very difficult at times but God you lead and guide us and you are with us and so Lord help us God to uh, be aware of your presence every day uh, seek every morning Lord, to remember who you are and what you've done for us. And then, Lord, uh, to desire to know and to fulfill that reason you made us, God. The reason, God, that, uh, that you uh, want to use our lives in this world. Thank you for those folks that are here. Uh, we pray you bless the fellowship tonight and the food so we can serve you and live for you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.